What's up world? Michael EJ coming to you with another video in the field of finance, business, and life. And today, in investing in the stock market, I want to help you avoid value traps, i.e. stocks that look cheap today, but they're cheap for a reason. We're, we all we see them all the time. A stock that has a lower valuation, lower PE multiple than the rest of the market, and you're like, oh, this stock's great. You value it, it looks fantastic. It's like, why isn't the market understanding this? And that's mainly because the market's paying for what the valuation may be tomorrow versus today. And I'm going to help you with some methods to kind of sidestep that problem and avoid the classic value dilemma. Now, there's three main methods you can do to avoid this value trap. It's very hard to resist it in the beginning when you value a company and they look undervalued mainly because they have a low multiple and the, and the fundamentals look okay. Now to dodge that, you need to consider growth. I've preached this on the channel before. Valuing growth is like a, it's like a balancing act. And right now, especially what, where valuations are today, growth is really important. You really need to understand the growth prospects and the growth characteristics of a company. So there's three ways you can do that. Incorporate it to evaluation and look further ahead. First way, and probably the most known way, is the PEG ratio. Most notably used by an investor named Peter Lynch. Very famed investor. He had a phenomenal track record. I want to say like averaging like 25, 30% over like a 20 plus year period. A large mutual fund. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. And his rule was peg ratio below one. Now let me tell you what that means. Take the PE, PE ratio, trailing PE ratio, he, and he divided it by whatever the growth rate was, trailing five years, compounding growth rate, multiplied by 100. So you'll get an even match to match. So um, for him, a company that has a 20 times PE multiple, but trailing five years was 20% growth, in you know, EPS, it's the kind of company he wanted. This is a very quick way to kind of understand growth, but there's a lot of problems with the peg ratio. First thing, are you gonna look four or five years? Or are you gonna look back? A lot of the research is looking back, but really, like I mentioned before, when you're in the stock market, you're paying for what you think the valuation will be tomorrow, not what it is today. So, Today is looking at the past. Tomorrow is looking to the future. The pay ratio doesn't really help with that. Additionally, that rule of just going under one, uh, it doesn't always work. You can easily run the problems using that rule, especially in a market where there's not that much growth to go around. You need to be a little bit more flexible in using that rule. Maybe considering, similar to PVGO, consider the life cycle of where that company's at. And if they're lower in life cycle, a lower peg ratio. If they're later in life cycle, higher peg ratio. So different dynamics. Do you count dividend yield? Do you count shareholder yield as growth? Do you count that in the equation? It's just tough to really get a call for. So to me, it's actually my least favorite way of considering growth and avoiding value traps. Second, try to estimate the future stock price. Now, that sounds similar to what you're doing today when you value a company, right? Not exactly. When I say estimate the future stock price, not just look at a year or two ahead, but project those earnings for a company five years. Project them out five years, value them at five years, and bring the present value back to today using a discount rate of, let's say 10%. Use 10%, historical number for um, stock market returns. Now, I like this method because it makes you look over a multi-year period. Further out, I've mentioned before that one of the best ways to gain an advantage in the stock market is to have a longer time frame. So if you're already investing longer, you're already looking further out, that just helps your case. Now, the downside is there's some tricky stuff for trying to value a company five years ahead versus today. Big part of it is the multiples. If you're gonna use multiples, and you don't understand how they usually work, 
they come down over time, they usually match where a company's at in their life cycle. You don't understand that dynamic and can't see an example of that, it makes it very tough. I'll explain now. So you have a company that's you project their earnings and you and today they have a trailing multiple of about 25 PE for a multiple of 20 PE. That's one year ahead. So what's a good multiple to value them five years ahead? It's not just like 16 or 15. There's more time, there's more to it than that. I mean, will growth just fall off a cliff? Will growth be sustained? What's the growth profile of that company? Is there any other companies in that industry that you can see that's older and you can use that as an example? Maybe five years from now, a 10 PE multiple will be better than using a 14 or 16. Just once again, tricky. And you also have to understand discounting back to the present value. So 10% might work in most cases, but if it's a higher risk company, then you might need to increase that to about 12%. Lower risk, maybe six to 8%. So those changing dynamics kind of matter too, somewhat similar to the peg ratio, but different dynamics. Now the method I'm going to suggest to you that I like the most and I use in every valuation is looking at the expected rate of return. There is this classic formula in finance called the Gordon growth formula, Gordon growth. So you usually just take um, the expected rate of return is dividend yield plus fundamental growth rate. Now those two make it up. Now there's a little bit more you can add to that. So for me, I also like to project five years to the future of a company and I look at what the compound growth rate will be. At the same time, I also want to look at the fundamental growth rate because they tell you two different stories. You got what you can see with the numbers, but you also got um, fundamentally what's going to happen. So company might grow, I'll use the stock market for example. Stock market EPS growth over the past maybe 25, 30 years, it's been around 10, 11%, around that point. So, and dividend yields 2%. So in the classic formula, you got 2% plus 10%, that's 12% expected rate of return. Now, um, you take that and you use the fundamental growth rate, which is return on investment times reinvestment rate, so in this instance, return on equity times any money not used in um, paying back dividends. So for the market, it's usually, for the S&P 500, it's about, I wanna say about 12% ROE, 50% um, retention rate. So that's a 6% uh, fundamental growth rate. So I used to take the average between the two. I got what I projected out five years. So for the S&P 500, that's 10% earnings per share. And I also got the fundamental growth rate um, at 6%, find the middle, that's 8%. So I got 2% on the dividend yield, I got 8% for expected growth, and I had a third component called uh, what I would call the multiple effect. Usually multiples come down over time for any company. I mean, if you start off as a flying company that barely has profits and then at the end of the life cycle, you're this old company is barely, barely growing, but you have high profits, high profitability, of course your multiple is going to come down over time. So it really just depends on where they are in the life cycle and that's another tricky part. Life cycle really matters and just let you know but usually you can take those two numbers, add them up in terms of dividend yield and growth rates and I just simply multiply that by maybe 80%, 0.8. Simple as that. Take the two plus the eight, that's 10%, multiplied by 80%. And my expected rate of return on the market, historically, has been about 8%. And that's kind of the way I like to look at it. Now you take that number and you value the company today. So whatever valuation you come with, you value the company today and you grow it out by 8% annually over the next five years. And you compound and you look how the stock price changes. A company might look fairly valued or even slightly overvalued today. But if that fundamental growth rate, um, that rate of return, is, if it's higher than the market, it's gonna catch up and maybe even surpass what you would think, especially if you know your target return. You know you wanna return 10% a year. And you know either you need to find an undervalued company that's gonna grow just fast enough to leapfrog that hurdle, come, 
compound it over five years, or you, you'll be fine finding a company that you think is overvalued, but it needs that expected rate of return to be 12, 13, 15%. And if you just incorporate that method into your valuation process, you will easily see that a lot of companies you might have liked in the past don't look that good. A lot of companies, you're like, why does this company have such a low multiple? Well, there's no growth prospects. There's nothing there. And that happens a lot. You will be surprised how often that will happen. It might be a little bit scary, to be honest. But that's just something for you to keep in mind. If you want to avoid value traps, I suggest incorporating one of these methods into your valuation process. And that's all I have for today. If you want to take this to the next level, if you want to actually incorporate this, let me know and let me know your results. Are there companies that you wouldn't have considered in the past that now you're like, oh, this company doesn't look that bad if I hold it for a couple of years? Or are there companies in your portfolio now that you're like, uh, looks kind of sketchy. I might want to get out now. Let me know in the comment section what you're thinking. Just keep these three in mind. And if you have any ideas or want to know any ideas for finance, business, and life, then I'm your guy. Check me out. Share, like, and comment below. Until the next time, peace.